of sexual assault at the Stanford campus, about the details of her case, and about the exceptional lenient sentence of the perpetrator. In response, she shocked the world by releasing her victim impact statement, finally showing her side of the story. After it was posted in BuzzFeed, her statement was read by 11 million people in just four days. Just for comparison, that's more than the population of my country, Hungary. It also inspired changes in the California legislation and led to the recall of the judge on the case. But most importantly, it gave victims all around the world the courage to share their story. Now, she reclaims her identity and tells us her story in her new memoir, Chanel Miller, Know My Name. Yeah, so in this interview with Chanel Miller, we want to focus on her side of the story. The events of that night, the trial that followed, how she tried to move on from all of that afterwards, and finally, to how she's now reclaiming her story in her new book, Chanel Miller, Know My Name. Of course, there will also, as always, be room for your questions for Chanel. However, this time that will be all the way at the end of the interview, and we'll let you know when that is so everything's clear. And then finally, before we move into this interview, we think it's important to stress one thing. This is a very sensitive and heavy issue that, unfortunately, some of you might also have experience with. And therefore, we want to stress two very important resources that you could go to in case that it's necessary. So firstly, all the study advisors at the UVA are open for you to go to them and have conversations with them about things like this. And it's important to note that those conversations are also confidential. So they can also, if you want, refer you to more specific help, but also if that's what you want, your story can also stay with them. And secondly, the Sexual Assault Center, or in Dutch, Centrum Seksueel Geweld, is what you could go to for more either legal or medical help, in case that's necessary. And I'll repeat this information all the way at the end for the people that forgot. So now, all that's left for me to say is everyone, please give a warm applause for our wonderful guest, Chanel Miller. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. It means a lot to us as a university that we get to interview you in front of all these students. Thank you. <laughs> and our dean is also here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, before we really go into the interview, we wanted to talk about the semantics of sexual assault mm -hmm. because we were researching this topic for weeks, but we still found it difficult to phrase some of our questions. For example, um, we found it hard to decide whether we should use the word victim, survivor or some alternative. How do you feel about these words? I'm honestly okay with the word victim because it's not wrong. And it's important to see that, like, at times I was very vulnerable and I was under attack and I did need help. So it's not always about, like, surviving and being strong and showing up and speaking your truth because at times you're extremely soft, you're really porous, you're absorbing all the negative commentary and you're being made a victim. Mm -hmm. So I think there's equal power in that word. I take equal pride in that word, I'm not offended by it, so it's yours. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so now that the semantics, which is very important, are a bit more clear, we want to talk a bit about the events of that night. Mm -hmm. So it started actually quite well. You were home and you were seeing your sister Tiffany yeah. for the first time in a while, and you were decided to go to a party with her and had fun, were drinking, but at some point your memory stopped. Yeah. Could you tell us about that night? Kind of until the point where your memory stopped. Yeah, I was about, I had graduated about seven months prior. I was living with my parents and I got my first like entry level job. I was really proud of myself. And um, my younger sister came home from the weekend, and Stanford University is basically like our backyard. And we went out to this party. I wasn't taking it very seriously. I was like, these university kids, like, <laughs> their beer tastes like pee. This is so low quality, the music sucks. I was dancing super hard. I think I describe it like dancing like a piece of seaweed in the book. What does that look like? Oh. Um. <laughs> That's great. Um, it's funny, I was actually asked that in trial. <laughs> they were like, how are you dancing? And I was like, silly, like wiggly. But um, 
but it was very serious, high stakes at that time. Um, anyway, um, yeah, we were there, and then my last memory is sort of standing with everyone on this patio outside. And um, the next memory was waking up in the hospital in a gurney, and I had blood on my hands, and my hair was full of pine needles. And when I would walk, it would leave a trail everywhere. Um, and I realized I didn't have my underwear on. And the deputy told me I had been sexually assaulted, and I did not believe him because it just didn't align with with my reality, you know. And I didn't know anyone. I hadn't spoken to anyone, so I kind of. I was like, I'll let him think that. I'll get the rape kit done, fine. Um, and that day, all they told me was that someone had been acting hinky at the party. Hinky was the word they used. And they said he had been chased away and caught and was in jail. And I was like, great. Like, there was some bad apple who was at this party and has been arrested. I had no idea that he had made physical contact with me. I wasn't told what state I had been found in, um, and was sort of just released back into the world and would not hear from anyone for 10 days. That's so crazy. And yeah. how did you figure it out then? If it, not, it wasn't at the hospital? I was at work. Um, I saw the news online. I read about how I was found half naked behind a dumpster, that he had been found penetrating me and was chased away, tackled. And um, as horrifying as it is, I also thought it was very clear. That's kind of the end of the story. Um, I thought, he has no case. And it was really alarming to slowly realize more and more um, how he would come into power. and how it's about hiring the best attorney, and how you have to prove that you're a good victim. You have to prove you're someone who wouldn't want something like this. Yeah. yeah. But how was that sitting amongst your colleagues, reading about the news? What was your reaction? You couldn't... Did you cry? Did you... No. Did you I talk about just muting my insides. I think a lot of what you do in the beginning of trauma is compartmentalize. I kept it in the far corner for a long time. Um, it's really interesting because when victims come out with their stories, people will say like, oh, she's after him. She's the party pooper. Why are you ruining everything? And people don't realize we're the ones who want to forget the most. We try the hardest to forget. We're not here to remind you always of what's happening or to bring it up again. We tried to forget, and I did. For eight months, I didn't tell a single person outside of my family. If you tried to speak to me about it, I would have screamed at you. I'd say, get this away from me. Don't you dare touch that topic. Um, it took a long time to accept what had happened and figure out a way I could speak about it in a way that I could be proud of. And what was it like to, as you said, for eight months, live such a double life where you tried to put Emily Doe in a corner and you tried, you tried to be Chanel Miller and just Chanel Miller, but at some point that becomes untenable, right? Right. I mean, you can do a lot of pretending. We can all show up every day in some form, but still be internally eroding little by little every day. I mean, even for the past four and a half years, I was anonymous. And over 90% of the people in my life never knew that I was assaulted. They thought I'd been working at the same company for the last four and a half years, that instead of writing a book, I was at a nine-to-five job. Um, yeah, so I've, I'm pretty good at that now. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, how did that affect your relationships to keep these things so private for so long? Yeah, I think anonymity, as good as it is for protecting you, it becomes really lonely. It affects your <clears throat> ability to connect with people. And I really craved human connection. Is that like a giant rain stick? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Yeah, yeah. Welcome it's to the Netherlands. <laughs> is it like an aesthetic, like calming thing? I mean, we ordered it for you. <laughs> yeah. We're just gonna medicine. like let that. That's so funny. I was like, is that real sporadic rain? No. Okay. I, I wish we could have the, the California <laughs> sunshine such as this, but unfortunately, you're gonna stay here for a couple more days. This yeah. is what you you're gonna expect. experience this. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of soothing. Anyway, it makes everything a bit more intense, which yeah. to the story is, I know, very wasn't necessary. Stormy, <laughs> dark and stormy night. Yeah, so, away from the rain and back, back to you. So, you were talking about how you found out at work mm -hmm. and that you read in that article for the first time about your perpetrator. Mm -hmm. But that was also the first time you read about the two guys that saved you, right? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about them and what it was like to realize that you were saved by these two people you'd never met? Yeah, two Swedes came to the rescue. They said, what the F are you doing? And when they saw him, they ran after him. One did a leg sweep, just like some ninja, I don't even know, <laughs> and tackled him. The other one stayed with me, made sure that I was okay, then went and they both sat on him and pinned his limbs down, and they were saying, apologize to her, do you think this is okay? I mean, they were confronting him on the spot, and they not only did that, they showed up time and time again to testify um, at the preliminary hearing, at the trial. So that's so incredible. And I always thought, like, in the darkest moments, even when you feel so cynical, there are people out there actively fighting for you who are so good and clear-headed and they know right from wrong immediately. They didn't kneel down and say like, tell us who you are, show us why we should help you, you know, earn your worth, earn your credibility. And so often that's what victims have to do. We have to yeah. prove that we're worth helping instead of worth critiquing. Um, and so that naturalness um, to which they came to my aid is something I will always feel. And they were like, I just knew even in the stuffy little courthouse, there are good people out there and if you stay in this long enough, you will find more of them. Did you ever meet them personally, actually? Yeah, we did. And, you know, like 60 Minutes said, can we film this on camera? And I said, I just want it to be my personal moment. And so, we went out to dinner. They tried to pay for dinner. <laughs> um, and we just caught up. And it was so, it's so incredible to have people who have been on the testimony stand to know that feeling, to, to feel, you know, they were talking about how it felt like a game. You go in there thinking it's like about justice and it's this pure glowing thing and you go in there and it's all about strategy it's about like who can speak faster how can i unpack your questions and do all this so for them to have that shared experience that i can't even explain to friends is so special yeah. mm -hmm. so you you just now mentioned the trial and we want to talk about that a little bit more now yeah so when we were reading your book we were we discovered that you thought that this case would never even go to trial in the first place. Why did you think that? Uh, because he ran away. <laughs> he was sort of like, he was just like took off, had wanted nothing to do with me. When they caught him, they're like, who is she? He's like, I don't know. So that to me says everything. Um, but we went to trial and it was so astounding how many questions they could ask you. You know, they'd say like, how many people were at that party? At what time did you arrive? How many fluid ounces did you consume? If you're drinking out of this cup, was it one third full, two thirds full, or, you know, where was it? If you had tea and water, did you drink tea first and then water and then tea or water? You know, and it's like, and I had gone to the restroom outside. I had peed in a bush. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're asking how many yards away, I don't know what your measurement is here, but how many yards away from the house did you pee? 
And I thought of myself, like, counting, like, marching out <laughs> to my bush, like, 15 yards, boom. And it, it's just like, you don't live like this. It's not natural. Yeah, exactly. I think live. if you ask anyone here, the audience... Totally. I'm almost tempted to just, like, party, pluck you from the audience and, like, tell me all about your party life. What did you have for dinner yesterday? What did you have for lunch? Who did you call? At what time? And so... I mean, it actually implemented this really damaging mindset in me because even after the trial, I still lived with a jury in my head. Like, everything I did, everywhere I went, everything I wore, I thought if something were to happen to me at this moment, how would I explain this? Because in the court world, everything demands an answer. Yeah. And that's not how life works. We do things because we want to. We're living. And living is messy, and we make mistakes. But that doesn't permit you to hurt other people. That's an entirely different story. Um, and so, I mean, a lot of what was healing about writing the book was that I finally was able to express self-doubt, which you're never allowed to show on the stand. Yeah. Um, I could show anger which was oppressed because you're not allowed to appear defensive. You know, I could be a human and um, stop doing all this posturing uh, that they, that, that process required. Yeah, and also when, when you talk about these questions that seem so irrelevant to the crime and what happened, like how did the defense attorney in any way find those things useful for the case, for the bigger story, whether what happens. Nobody knows. <laughs> but I, it like, like you went to a taqueria, what did you eat? I was like, burrito. And I was like, taco. I was like, fuck, I don't know. Like, I just, but like, I would, I would come out of the courthouse and be sitting in my car and be like, what did I say? What was that? And just those hours that I spent obsessing over these tiny things that you're being convinced that they're significant that if they can add, it's like a multiple choice test. And if you get enough wrong, then we're not gonna believe you. And this didn't happen, and this isn't real, and we're right and you're wrong. And that's so terrifying that it's not enough to have physical evidence, that it's not enough to have naked photos of my body presented before a room of strangers, right? Yeah. The, the amount that's required for us to show you that something matters and is important is absolutely insane. Yeah. They tried to wear you down, but you went through with this exhausting trial, and yeah. then um, we want to address now the sentence. Yeah. Because the prosecutors actually suggested six years, mm -hmm. which is already lower than the maximum, mm -hmm. and Brock got away with three months in a county jail, right? Yes. Were you surprised? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was convicted of three felonies and served three months in county jail. And it was so low, we hadn't even expected that answer. We were completely blindsided. And I remember, you know, at that point, like I had spent so much of the trial being afraid. I would come in like shaky. I felt so intimidated and threatened. And by the end, I was so worn out. I was so sick of how they were treating my family and my sister. There was this turn where I was like, I'm done with you. I will destroy you. Like the fear evaporated because I was so angry at that point. And it's weird. It's almost like this calm comes over you. Like you have taken everything <laughs> and now like I am here. And it, it just... I transformed a lot, and when I spoke the statement, it was the first time in court that I didn't break down crying, that I wasn't completely washed away or had to go recover in the bathroom. And I was like, yeah, I did it, boom, mic drop. And then the judge was like, six months, like, thanks for coming. And there was this moment of like, oh, I didn't read the room correctly. Like, this isn't a serious thing. And that day, my sentencing happened in between other people's sentencings for like DUIs. And I thought, I'm just like a little scheduled time slot. I am a speck on this earth. Like really, who cares about me other than my immediate family? 
And that was my takeaway. It didn't occur to me like, wow, you've done this brave thing, you're writing so eloquent, whatever. I folded it up, put it in my purse, and when they're like, can we release it? I was like, yeah, because who cares, right? Like, who on this like community blog is gonna like thumb down or thumb up it? So that was my mindset, and that's how I fell asleep that night. Um, so to wake up, and then have like a million views by that day and then just watch it go up by the millions. I mean, I talk about in the book how it's really scary that if I had said, no, don't publish the statement, it's not worth anything, I'm not worth anything, I could have continued the rest of my life carrying that belief. And I say the judge was the king of this tiny kingdom and I thought he was the only authority we should listen to. We follow his rules, and his opinion is the most important. But when in reality, in the real world, he was wrong, and we were all right. And the difference between living my life thinking I'm crap at writing and my words are worth nothing versus millions of people reading it and being where I am today, that difference of realities is so slim, yeah. and that's terrifying. Yeah. And so I want everyone to think about how if you're ever being talked down to, if what's happening to you is being minimized or muted, think about how, like, who is the ruler of your tiny kingdom? Who is the ruler of your household or of your classroom? And it's important to get a second opinion to not, to not think that's the ultimate truth, that you carry the ultimate truth, and that you have to follow that to the people who will understand that and see you. Yeah. Amongst those like thousands or even more letters, was there anything that really struck you or that really touched you? Yeah, I mean, for a long time, I didn't like the sight of pine needles, and they're everywhere. You can't really escape them. I remember the feeling of like tugging them out of my hair or scratching my skin or having them fall out. And so this woman had photographed this like beautiful pine tree with sunlight behind it and sent me this photo and she just said, I want these pine trees to be yours. You're like, he doesn't own that. Like he doesn't get to take the beauty of the world from you. Um, so she was giving them back to me and that thoughtfulness to think of a detail that might seem so small to others but so significant to me yeah. was really incredible. Um, people are incredible. And I hope that comes through in the book too because for as much hostility there was and nastiness, mm -hmm. I think the good has outweighed the bad like a thousand times over at this point. Wow. And also, um, what really was interesting is that how you got so many responses from complete strangers, Yeah. but the perpetrator actually never showed compassion, did he? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think if he said sorry or if he really acknowledged what he did, would that have helped you move on? Yeah, I mean, from the very beginning, I thought that's what was going to happen. I thought he was going to settle immediately, like, look, I was caught red-handed, I'm going to amend this and, like, back away slowly. But instead, he armed himself, he upped his defenses and did a full-blown attack. And that was not okay with me. And so from the beginning, I said, all I want you to do, I mean, often I think all that we're asking is like acknowledge what you did yeah. and promise me you won't do it again. Because a lot of the time, we're actually okay tolerating a lot of pain. We treat ourselves the worst sometimes, but the idea of it happening to someone else is something we can't live with. That's why you can't sleep at night. Um, and that's why it's so hard to let go. Um, but often we can't even get an acknowledgement, and that's what's so mind-blowing. Yeah, so now 
we talked about your story and we talked a bit about the trial. Yeah. But we want to talk about more the general biases that victims face mm -hmm. in the courthouse, but also in society in general. Yeah. So we touched upon this a little bit, but people, also in your case, often blame the victim for what happened to them. Mm -hmm. They say, why did she drink so much? Why did she even go to a frat party in the first place? What do you think of comments like this? How do you respond to them in your head or in conversation? Yeah, I mean, you go to a party because you want to go to a party, not because you want to get raped. Um, pretty simple. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. No one goes with the intention of being harmed, so therefore nobody asks for it. I mean, I think in the alcohol thing, even if you took alcohol off the face of the earth, tomorrow you would still have rape, you would still have misogyny. It doesn't get to the roots of these issues. Um, I think what's so common is that we isolate victims. I describe it in the book as like putting them in the corner and like watching them look at this mobile of different elements of self-blame and self-hate. That's what we train them to do. So go think about what you did wrong and we refuse to look at the larger patterns. You know, and I say, even wearing a skirt, like you think the little extra four inches of thigh is what's causing like mass assault. You know, it's just, it's so unbelievable to me. And it's just small minded if you're not able to see the bigger picture. How can we? all be individually so flawed yeah. that it's happening to all of us. That there's just something in particular that's wrong with you and you and you and you and you and you and me that's causing this. Yeah, so about this, you also say in your book, like, look, even if we, or we are more careful and don't go to fat parties, the only thing that you actually achieve is sending the perpetrator off to someone else. Exactly. And you never get to the root of the issue. Right. And Today we don't only want to talk about what's going wrong right now, but we also want to talk about what we can do better. So yes. therefore, what do you think we should do instead as a society to tackle this issue better? Yeah, I mean, like you said, when you advise a victim, like, take care of yourself, all you're advising is self-protection. Like, make sure you don't get assaulted, but maybe she will. Make sure you're not the one drunkest at the party, because then it'll be you, and it'll be you know, let someone else be the drunkest. That's not, that's not taking us anywhere, right? You're just offloading it to the next person. Um, and then as a society, yeah, again, just coming back to the idea that, um, that worth shouldn't have to be earned. It should be inherent. It should be there at the beginning. We talk a lot about due process. Where's the due process? for the guy, like he is innocent until proven guilty. And it's like, okay, well if he's innocent until proven guilty, then we have to believe she's telling the truth until you can prove otherwise. But so often it's flipped. We assume she's lying until she can prove she's telling us yeah. the truth. Like where's our due process then? Um, so it needs to start there with just listening. Yeah. Yeah, so that's also what we now want to talk about a little bit more. So. Mm -hmm. How do we listen to the people around us? How do we teach more and better about consent? So in your book, you also talk about this and you had a metaphor that I thought was very nice and interesting. So we shouldn't treat consent like a single traffic light, you said. Not just, wait, now I forgot the colors on traffic light. Not just red purple. and green. Yeah. <laughs> purple, would be nice <laughs> if I turned the world. But not just red and green, no and yes, mm -hmm. but it's a lot more than this. So the other question is, how should we treat consent? Like, what is the yellow situation? Yeah, I mean, I say it's not one traffic light, it's like a series of traffic lights. You're driving down a street to get to the climax, but <laughs> you have to be paying attention the entire way. It can't just be like, yeah, she said, yeah, and that's it you're constantly sending signals to each other. I talk about sex being an exchange of power. It's being passed back and forth. Yeah. Sex should never be, I want what I want and I don't care what you want. You know, I want what I want and I'm gonna do whatever I can to take it. 
um, that's when it's wrong. You have to address that dynamic um, and be constantly aware. Yeah, so like when it's not just yes and no, it's of course also a little bit more complex mm -hmm. because there is not a clear buzzword that tells you this is what I should do. Yeah. So do you have some advice to people on how to navigate like the complex reality of consent? Uh, just or do you think it's not complex after all? Just pay attention. Yeah. And have the goal be pleasure, not just tolerance. Um, just be in tune with the person. I mean, bodily violation is so specific in the way that it hurts. We can't get out of our bodies. Yeah. Whatever happens, you have to live with, right? Yeah. This is the only vessel you're given for your single lifetime on this earth. So it's important to respect that. Um, yeah. yeah. Another consent-related issue that played a huge role in your trial as well was alcohol mm -hmm. and how that blurs the line. Mm -hmm. um, you were constantly criticized for blacking out during mm -hmm. your trial and also on social media. How is it possible mm -hmm. that both of you were drunk and this was used against you, but also in favor of him? Right. So it's fascinating to me that he can use it to argue that he couldn't think clearly. Because I know many men who can be very drunk who don't assault people. That is a possibility, and as long as that's a possibility, why should we settle for anything less? Um, yes, so, I mean, it's, it continues to baffle me why it was so difficult, especially if I was unconscious. I think people didn't want to affiliate themselves with my vulnerability. It's very tempting when someone is assaulted to keep them at arm's length and say, you put yourself there mm -hmm. and I'm smart enough to not. So that will never happen to me. It's this feeling of safety people give themselves. And I think if you're on the receiving end of that criticism, just remember that other people give their opinions very freely. And it's a very easy thing to do. But to actually be in it living it is an entirely different story and you have to give yourself credit for that. Yeah. Like as bad as everything got, as much snot was like coming out of my nose in front of everybody, I thought at least I'm here, I'm doing it. And if you wanna criticize me, why don't you sit here and do it better? But if you're just gonna be at home typing little comments on your computer, then like stay out of my way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think throughout it was just this constant, you don't know anything, you have a hole in your memory, your testimony is too fragmented and you have nothing to offer. And the entire time I was kind of thinking, yeah, I look like this weepy, weak person, but the entire time I'm observing everything, right? Nothing is being lost on me and there's so many more layers to this story than you're seeing. I thought for so long, they're like, oh, she's not a threat. You know, like, she's a nobody. And I was like, I'm a threat <laughs> because I'm smart and I can write and none of this will be lost on me. So you didn't blame yourself for blacking out, right? No, I mean, it's not, it doesn't feel great the next day, but um, no, I mean, it, you can never link blacking out with permission to hurt. You know, it's A doesn't lead to B. Blacking out leads to blacking out, and he should have never touched me. Yeah, but it seems like for society, blacking out means putting yourself in a vulnerable position. And even now, there was a podcast with Harvey Weinstein's um, mm -hmm. lawyer mm -hmm. who said that she has never been sexually assaulted because she never put herself in that position. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to her? Again, it's that sense of like, I can float above this um, and I will forever be safe. Um, 
it's a much harder reality to accept that it can happen to anybody at any yeah. time. It can happen at work, in a parking lot, at a dinner party. And that's a far more gruesome reality to accept. So we prefer that it happens to the weak ones or the dumb ones. And um, that's what we do. Yeah, so you said that this can happen to anybody mm -hmm. at any time. But also something we're seeing in the US is that it seems to happen disproportionately much at university campuses mm -hmm. and fraternities, just like your case. Mm -hmm. What do you think causes it to happen so much in these places? What, what factors? Do you have fraternities here? Yeah, like we do, but it's, it's kind of different. So this university is just where we have class, but we don't all live here. We need to go through an arduous process of finding a place and then paying way too much. <laughs> so oh. it's not like the US. We have fraternities, but it's more on a like, it's away from where we live. Got not it. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, it's this, I think it's, for so long we haven't taken assault in these places seriously. Mm -hmm. And we don't take, we don't consider this as violence, right? It's just something that happens. It's so embedded in the party culture and we constantly downplay it and say like, don't let it happen again. Um, it was a slip up or like too murky. Um, we don't think of it as a crime. We have a lot of cases in the US where the assault was filmed by multiple people. Um, that tells me that it's a joke. It's like entertainment. It's something to be shared or mocked. They don't even realize like, hey, you're filming your own evidence. Like no one films themselves robbing a bank because that's stupid. And they don't think it's stupid. They think it's funny. And that's mind blowing. They're so not threatened by the fact that it's a real crime that you can be prosecuted for. So it, it, it's just like, it's, just, it's, the, it's the not taking it seriously. Um, or treating it as a crime, where there are serious consequences. There are no consequences. That's how it is so much of the time. And that's why when I finally had a conviction, it's like, we got this. And in the book, I describe it as, it was like watching the judge release a fish that had been caught. Like, we finally got one, and he just, like, let it swim away. That's what it was. Yeah, so you said that there's no, no consequences and it's not seen as a crime because of all this party culture. Yeah. What do you think universities can do about this to change this attitude? Yeah, as definitely see the larger patterns again. Don't treat them as isolated incidents. For my case, they thought it was enough to tell him to leave campus and then they went on Everything continued, we got rid of the problem. I was like, your problem's still there. He was simply a symptom of a larger issue that you're failing to confront. So realizing that it's not singular, it just is a sign that more is happening. Yeah, so, <laughs> what's, I, when I read your book and when you were talking about Stanford and their mm -hmm. way of dealing with it, mm -hmm. you were talking about the bench mm -hmm. and the quotes on that bench. Could you give, tell the audience a bit about that? Because I thought that was so kind of characterizing and striking and yeah. an example of kind of how it's dealt with this in a majority of cases. Yeah, so there's a memorial garden where I was assaulted, which is sort of an odd thing in the first place, right? Um, they, they said I could put a plaque with one of my quotes at this garden. And so I selected a quote and they said, that's too much, too triggering. Give us another one. So I gave them another one. And it was, you took away my worth, my privacy, my time, my confidence, my energy, blah, blah, until today. Um, and they said, no, that's also too upsetting. We want this place to be inspiring and beautiful. And I thought, oh, it's not, it's not my job to be your like beacon of hope. Yeah. I'm not here to be the flowers that bloom in your garden. Um, and uh, so they came back with a quote from my statement that was, 
I'm okay, everything's okay, I'm okay. <laughs> oh, and I was like, whoa, because I, that's what I told my sister yes. when I was coming out of the hospital, when I was like, absolutely not okay. And it, it was almost creepy that they wanted to rebrand it, like, I'm fine, and everything's fine, and thank you. You know, it's like... I almost let them do it because I was like, ooh, you could have this here forever. And that's like more of a statement. Um, but I didn't do that. So I just <laughs> said, hey, like, I'm done. The students fought really hard and then and the wonderful professor, Michelle Dauber, and a few days ago, they finally installed it. And like, their email, when they finally agreed to do it, it wasn't like, hey, we're sorry for this, da, da, da. I just got an email that was like, hey, do you want it on the bench or like by the fountain? And I was like, this is your white flag. Like it, it was just, it took three and a half years to get a plaque like this big with one sentence on it. Um, and that to me says a lot. It's sort of like, yeah, we, we want to honor your story, but only the shiny parts. And that's not enough for me. And I think about how at these talks, like, I always want to take the audience to a hopeful place. Like, I want to leave you in a nice place. But then I was like, nah, I want to leave survivors in that place and the rest of you, like, horrified. Because, like, that's, that's the truth. You know, not everyone deserves to be taken out to this, like... Yeah confetti and even with the Weinstein conviction I gave a statement to the New York Times that was like not everyone gets to celebrate you know survivors put in the work but so many people also looked away and we have to start confronting these things and it's not it's not so simple as a verdict nothing is that clean yeah. but even to survivors that gives up like a very harmful message, right? That you have to be okay. You got this. It's it's oh, easy yeah. almost. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I sort of refused to be that for them. Yeah. I had like a dark line in the book that was like, I will not give you hope if you haven't given me any reason to feel any. Yeah. Something I had like, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. And you also compared in your book um, healing to a non-existent finish line, right? Yeah. What, what did you mean by that? It means that I, so f healing is complicated. Um, and for a long time, I felt like while I was writing my book, I was spending so much time in my past and I was falling behind because you look at your peers and everyone's like getting promoted, doing jobs. And I was like, what am I doing? Spending all my time in my past. I'm falling behind. I'm not following this like linear forward trajectory. Um, but my editor described it as an undertow. Every time you revisit your past or the assault or whatever trauma, it's like a wave comes crashing down over you and it wipes you out. At the beginning, every time I talked about it, I would be wiped out for weeks. I would just be mute, wouldn't talk to anyone after coming home. And little by little, I was able to be wiped out and then come back and be on my two feet. And your progress really is being measured by how quickly you can return to that state, how quickly you can get back on your feet. And each time it was faster and faster. And now I can speak about the assault today. And then after this, I'll probably get dessert and take a bath and I'm fine. And that's, that's what healing is. So just realize that if you are processing a trauma, spending time there, the ability to even spend time in your past shows that you're getting stronger. Yeah. You're not behind because of it. Yeah. Finally, before we move on to the audience question, we just wanted to really use this opportunity that you're here mm -hmm. and ask you some advice on how we as university students can help our friends or some peers who experience a similar situation. Yeah, I'm, I think about how for me, since I was the victim in this case, the focus was always on me. The resources were given to me, the advocate was given to me, but at the same time, I had a sister, I had a family around me who were also hurting, 
we have to acknowledge that there's this ripple effect. And I know it was hard for them to go ask for help because they thought, who am I to complain? I'm not the victim in this case. My sole role is to take care of her and tend to her needs when really they're all being affected. Um, I am the body that was hurt physically, but the assault is an event that affected everyone emotionally and psychologically, and they are equally deserving of getting help and attention. So for anyone supporting a victim, just know that you, you also need to be nourished and to be taking care of yourself, and it's also going to be difficult for you. And when it comes to reporting blah, 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 um, it's really important in not to impose what you think the victim should do because the most important thing in the immediate aftermath is to restore agency. She has to feel like she has some choice with what happens next because something just happened that completely wasn't her choice. So if you say you have to go to police, that's going to feel really upsetting. So it's important to lay out options. Here are the things you can do. Do what you wish to do. And um, for anyone, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, you're so courageous, or like, I couldn't have done what you did. Like, it's not about your courage. The system is not built for you to succeed. It doesn't matter how much courage you have, because there are so many obstacles along the way that are permitting you from moving forward. You have every right to not want to report and feel afraid. So don't put that burden on yourself. Like we collectively need to create spaces where you do feel like if you were to come forward, you would be believed and heard and that instead of just judged and shunned back to your corner. So yeah, be gentle to yourself and other people be gentle to survivors. Thank you. Um, we've been asking a lot of questions, but I'm sure that our audience has just as many. So mm -hmm. let's hear some of those. Um, if you would like to ask a question, just put up your hand and then our mic guy is going to come there. Um, the girl in the fourth row. You? <laughs> Could you stand up? Um, hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the role that sort of social media played in the way, <laughs> the way that your story came across. Because something that I find um, quite jarring is that often there are these sort of waves where sort of stories of sexual assault become viral, but then it like sort of quietens down a bit. And what did it feel like as a victim? You know, this idea of like people reading your story in four days, 11 million views, but then the progress since then, because it's been four and a half years since then, and what it feels like to have be, become that sort of figurehead on social media and then have it sort of quietened down. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. What was so incredible was that even with the excitement of the attention, it was also terrifying, because I thought any day I'm going to be outed and what was so wonderful was that any time a reporter would tweet, like, if you have any information on her, blah, 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 people would say, leave her alone. She needs to heal. Like, she's done enough. People were actively protecting me and trying to restore me back to a place of quiet. Um, and the only reason I was able to write the book is because they had formed this, like, barricade around me, just like this fortress where that allowed me to go off into my little cave and type for three years. Um, so, I don't know, it was this beautiful, like, insulated quality that they created. But yeah, it is, I have had to grapple a lot with identity. I owe it to the world for slowly teaching me who I am. Um, it's not easy to take compliments. When people compliment me, there's a little thing that's like, boom, boom. And I have to like move that little thing aside and say, like, listen to what they're trying to tell you. Listen to what they want you to know about yourself. And like, let that come into you and like, make you sit a little higher. So by reading all those comments gradually over time, I was teaching myself more who I was and what I mean to people and what my words do and what I'm capable of. So. Ultimately, like the attention kept 
not the attention, but that, that kindness kept feeding me throughout those years while I was writing. Thank you. The girl on the right. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Um, I was wondering, because um, you spoke of justice at the beginning, and um, although the verdict and sentencing didn't give you that justice, whether writing this book and having your story heard in your own words, does that give you a sense of justice? Mm. And um, yeah, what do you think about that? That's interesting. I don't. So when the verdict was read, I talk about how I expected it to be like a trombone blaring, champagne popping moment. Um, and what happened instead, as the jury said, you know, guilty, 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 I was hit by this like total, all consuming sadness. Because I realized the person who I was sitting there and the person who was in that hospital were so different. And when I was in the hospital, I was so vulnerable and I needed to take care of myself and I didn't. And over the last, that year and a half, I had learned to doubt myself, to devalue anything that I said. Um, and when you finally hear your truth being validated, when the jury was saying yes, guilty, yes, 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 there's this moment of, oh my goodness, I was right all along. Why did I spend the last year and a half hating myself? Why did I drift so far from who I was? And so much of what I've been doing is getting back to that core self. And I remember that day, I promised myself, you will never drift that far from your truth again. If someone confronts you and you know your truth to be different, speak it, like push back. Don't succumb to that. And a lot of my writing, I hope, is just, you know, I see a lot of other survivors drift. Like maybe I did do something wrong, maybe I am stupid, maybe I did deserve, and like pull them back and be like, no, don't do that, because I did that for a year and a half, and you don't want to go your whole life and then have at the end someone finally validate you and say it was wrong and you're like, why didn't I know that from the beginning? Why did I spend so much time being so mean to myself you know, and not coming into my power? And so I don't know if, I don't even know if justice, I don't know if you call that justice, but like as long as I can restore people's confidence like, that's how I measure my victories. Thank you. Carly, do you want to choose? Um, yeah, the guy on the left in the front. Uh, my question is about the dialogue surrounding sexual assault. Mm -hmm. We see a, uh, more of it in the U.S., but outside of it, there really isn't anything, like in this university and others, nobody discusses it, discusses mm. it openly. What do you think that, that affects the culture of rape and what can we do about it? Yeah, I mean, again, it goes back to the whole plaque. Like this is too dark to look at. It's too uncomfortable to grapple with. And the responsibility falls so often on the victim to filter the story in a way that makes it acceptable to you, in a way, we have to package it in a way where you'll be willing to engage with it. You know, that itself is like an art that we have to master in order to get people to listen. So I always encourage people not to shy away. And I also always say, like, if she's in it, if she was the one hurt, the least you can do is listen to it, right? It's sort of the only ask we have is to bear witness. And you don't even have to fix anything. You don't have to heal her or make everything right. You just have to say, like, I acknowledge 
what you're going through, and most of all, you're not crazy, because that's another sentiment that we're often given. Like, you're not crazy, you have every right to be angry. I understand why you feel this way. These very simple statements go so far when you're in this state of confusion and isolation. Like, I talk a lot about, there was a grand gesture in the beginning of being saved. That was, that was a big, wonderful thing. If you can do that, do that. Um, but so many of the moments that saved me along the way were very small. I talk about how, before I went in to testify for the first time, the court reporter pulled me aside and she said, if you ever get nervous, look at me. And she winked at me, which I, like, I can. <laughs> but um, it was so cool. And then when I was on the stand and, you know, being grilled, I looked at her and it's that, like, I'm there. For- oh, damn, that's a good <laughs> wink. Um, but it's that the whole, I write, I'm with you. Like, I'm with you no matter what. Like, I don't care what storms come, I don't care what happens externally, I don't care if we lose this case, I will be by your side. If you can hear that and not worry all the time that you're gonna be dismissed because you're too angry and you threw too many tantrums or you're too withdrawn, if people just stay with you, like that'll, that'll take you wherever you need to, to go. Yeah. So thank you all for your great questions. We're sadly almost approaching the end and we have Two more short questions for you. Yes. So we talked a lot about things that happened to you in the past, mm-hmm. and now we want to end by looking forward a bit more. So when we were reading your book, mm-hmm. one of the first things you said was about your childhood dream. Yeah. And your childhood dream was to become a mascot so that you could <sighs> dance without being seen. <laughs> because you liked dancing a lot, but you were also very shy. Yeah. So what is your dream for the future right now? Actually, yeah, the dancing thing is sort of a problem. I was in San Francisco (laughs) at a place called the Boom Boom Room, dancing, and this girl came up to me, and she's like, are you Chanel? And I was like, not right now. Like, (laughs) not right now, I'm not. Please unsee this. Um, Seaweed. Seaweed. (laughs) I still have to figure that part out. And then the future, like, the best feeling about my future is the power of choice. Like, I was assaulted six or seven months out of university. Like, you, you graduate and you, like, have your whole life ahead of you, and then suddenly, like, boom, I'm confined to this, like, dark, stinky underworld um, that I didn't know how to get out of. And for so long, I, like, couldn't see a way out. Um, I had, ooh, yeah, that was dark. I went to dark places in my mind, but I remember in the book I write about One time my mom sat me down and she said, "Um, yeah, your future like holds things that you can't even imagine right now. They're beyond what you're able to imagine. And she came from like a mountainside in China and talked about how she now had daughters in California with a swimming pool and orange and lemon trees and a convertible. And like, she didn't even know what a swimming, she'd never seen a swimming pool. And she was like, until she was in her twenties. And so, She's like, your life is there for you. You just can't see it yet. And she was completely right because now I'm here. Like, if you told me when I was in this, like, teeny little windowless courtroom in Palo Alto that, like, hey, you're going to be in Amsterdam, like, two ladies are going to be winking at you and, like, all these random people in the balconies staring (laughs) down. There's going to be, like, rain sticks and, like, charcoal murals. I'd be like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? It's like, you have to live with the belief that your future is probably more absurd and beautiful than you could possibly imagine. And that's like, it's true. And that's, that's what I feel now. Like, who the heck knows? But the point is, it's going to be wonderful. Well, I think nothing to add, beautiful less words. <laughs> I'm gonna have some short announcements and then I want a really, really warm applause for you. Yeah. So we have some interviews coming up. We have Piketty on Friday, and that's going to be very exciting. Please be early because a lot of people want to come. And then next week we have two more. We have Kim Whaley, who is an American constitutional expert, and we have Geert Mack, who's a famous Dutch historian. Uh, so that's for the announcements. And oh, one final thing is these QR codes over here, 
you can scan them with your phone and then you can give us feedback whether you liked the interview or not and what kind of guests you would see. You did like yeah. it, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> you did like it, at least this one. They did. So, yeah, that being said, just very warm applause to you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.